Why was One Punch Man Season 2's animation so mediocre? Lack of talent, budget, laziness? Well, in an industry where animators go to hospital thanks to overwork, or you know, occasionally die from it, safe to say I don't think that's the answer. So how about budget? Well, again, like I said in this video, the character designer Chikashi Kabota mentioned years back that most TV animations have a similar budget and an average one at that. Rather, the actual reason why Season 2's animation felt underwhelming in comparison is firstly, one of the biggest problems with modern day anime, and that is a very underrated aspect of what can allow anime to look good, time. When you kind of need a couple of thousand drawings per episode, as well as checks to assess the quality, then off to another group that draws a cleaned up version, which then needs to be scanned in and have line work and the colors applied, and a billion other things, you kind of need a bit of time to get it all done, and so it doesn't look like this. And like I said before, in an industry that more than ever lacks it, One Punch Man Season 2 is one of those many examples. I tried reaching out to staff that actually worked on Season 2, and it was very much confirmed this was the case. And when digging further, it seems they had 6 months to produce 12 episodes. For comparison, the standard length behind an average anime episode is 2-3 to three months. That's 80% less time. 80%. Even Dragon Ball Super, another high profile show, notorious for its awful schedule and moments of lackluster animation as a result of it, had around 4 weeks at its lowest. Honestly, I'm surprised the staff didn't resort to just PowerPoint animation at that point. The fact that you still had animation like this created amongst such a mess of a production speaks not only to the talent but the insane amount of work the staff put in. This is also one of the main reasons behind the common complaint that some fights took place off screen. But it goes even further. Some theorized at the time that the studio was possibly producing shows they knew they didn't have enough staff to make in house, or in other words made at their own studio, and instead just outsource much of that work to others who would animate it instead. A pretty common practice. As Cullum from the Carnipper Effect notes, a lot of studios aren't being paid enough for being main animation producers. Now yes, there was still a bit of outsourcing outside of Japan to a Chinese studio known as LAN, who were also joined by a bunch of freelancers tackling a decent chunk of key animation in episode 8. Even with such a large group assembled though, the credits would still point to that JC staff were heavily involved. And keep in mind, this episode was the largest gathering of non-JC animators. Overall, JC chose to take on a lot of the animation themselves, putting more strain on everyone naturally, but also giving them no room to breathe. Now that might sound like a self-inflicted wound. Why would the higher-ups, who know the staff don't have enough time to create animation for this season, they're well aware this is an unrealistic schedule, wouldn't offload an entire episode or two off to some other studio. As a matter of fact, around the same time another one of their shows, High School Girl, they actually did that. It originally was intended to be 2D, although it seems they didn't have enough staff for that, so it ended up becoming 3D and would be produced by another company, SMDE, and well, a few other different ones being involved as well. So why was One Punch Man then the exception? I don't have a direct answer from any director per se, although time has proven there are some clear advantages from it. For one, you can achieve greater cohesion in a stylistic sense, because having a completely different team handle an episode can be a double-edged sword, depending on who it is and what their circumstances are. In some cases, it might bring a downgrade visually, because perhaps said studio is also burdened by too many projects himself, and their best animators are off working on another show. At the same time, it could allow for an entirely fresh approach and can provide a bump up in quality. But most of all, efficiency and communication will always be tighter when handled by a smaller group, all gathered together in the same office. When the director is just down the hall, it goes without saying that there are going to be fewer complications than when you're sending the workload to a team thousands of miles away. I think if anything, this decision clearly indicates that the show wasn't some afterthought by the producers, as some have made out, considering simply the amount of their own staff they poured into this project. Still, it's an interesting decision to have been made by the higher-ups, and peculiar decisions don't stop there. Putting the whole time issue aside, there was another problem that affected the animation, and that was poor compositing. Compositing is handled by the photography team, and I do not mean these guys. This is sort of a leftover name from the era where cameras were actually used in this stage. 
But to put it simply, it involves taking all the elements produced by the various departments, background art, 2D animation, 3D animation if used, and placing them all together. Of course, to make everything blend together and add a sense of depth, they will use different types of lighting, blur, textures, and other effects to achieve this. However, at the same time, poor compositing can detract from the readability of the animation. And man, was that a problem with Season 2. As an example, we have this clip, the textures and colors are so overbearing, it obscures the drawing underneath. To the point, it's almost just this blob of color in parts. To be more specific, this is the result of mediocre value control, which affects the clarity of the image. Although the airbrushing doesn't do it any favors either, creating a muddy look and just making everything less clear again. Great animation, bad compositing. And there are so many examples of this where good animation was obscured. In this scene by Freelancer Yen, these cool hand-drawn effects are replaced with a basic glow, with other effects such as the lightning and dust effects that came after being completely removed. But the most egregious example of all was the removing of the Terminator impact frame by animator Zucchini Juice, marking an all-time low for JC staff. Now there's a possibility these cuts were removed due to time, but either way my point is simply that it wasn't just a tight schedule animators had to contend with. Now the second main reason is the departure of series director Shingo Natsume. I went in depth as to the importance of his presence in the why One Punch Man's animation looks so good, so I really recommend checking that out to give context to what I'm about to say. But moving on, while Natsume's connections with the top action animators in the industry certainly helped, it was also his team building skills and the relationships he formed with many animators back on Space Dandy that made many of these talented animators eager to jump back on another project with him. Again, I'll mention like I did in that video, that the majority of the best animated moments in Season 1 were either by freelancers or animators from different studios to Madhouse. The scene between Lord Boros and Saitama where you had like a million impact frames and some incredibly detailed debris was by the legendary Yutaka Nakamura from Studio Bones. Meanwhile, Arafumi Amai from Wit Studio, the guy behind some of the most iconic battles in Attack on Titan, handled a large part of the Genos and Saitama fight and a decent amount of the Boros one as well. The main part where Saitama takes on the subterraneans was by freelancer Yoshimichi Kamada, as well as handling other moments like Genos taking on the Sea King. Honestly, I could go on and on. You even had animators from Studio Trigger, and the number of freelancers on this project for the first season was crazy. I mean, even Natsume was one. Of course, it's not like Madhouse's own animators just sat around and did nothing. One of the studio's best action animators, Hidehiko Sawada, definitely made his mark with his section of Genos taking on Saitama and this scene. To put it simply, considering you had the best names all gathered together, it was highly unlikely that such a team would be topped. But even so, if JC staff were given a good schedule, it could have looked phenomenally better. As we saw before, Season 2 still had good animation amongst the chaos. Imagine how great it would have been if they were given the same time Season 1's team had. And on that note, I need to mention the names that still managed to shine amongst it. And of course, that brings us to our boy, Aoki. If there was a moment in this season you were like, hey, this kind of reminds me of the first one, there's a high chance that's him. He mentioned a while back that he went through a bunch of Sakuga Mads actually from the first season, and you can definitely see the influence, such as Kamada's inky brush strokes or Emai's detailed debris cut. Cool, references aside though, Aoki seemed to possess his otherworldly ability to consistently produce scenes filled with animated movement and dynamic camera work, all while tackling the most work out of everyone being present for every episode. I have no doubt Aoki's work was a bit of a morale booster to a lot of the animators around him, and safe to say season 2 wouldn't have been the same without him. Of course, it's not just Aoki who produced some excellent work, there are others such as key animator Yuji Takaji, bringing loose movements and stylish timing, making for some engaging action sequences. There are also the many freelancers, Ryan White providing some nuanced character acting in episode 8, and some of my styled action in 11 or Julian Bentley with some very loose character animation. Even Yoshimichi Kamada returned thanks to the request of the series author 1. At the end of the day, season 2 had some amazing animation. It's just a pity that it was quite inconsistent thanks to the staff having an awful schedule chucked at them. Even so, I hope this video provided a different perspective and perhaps some appreciation for the staff and what they had to put up with. But with that note though, brings us to the conclusion of why One Punch Man Season 2's animation was so mediocre. 
So thank you everyone for watching and please check out my Patreon so I can make more videos like this that dive behind the scenes of anime and bring to light a lot of info that usually just circulates in small communities. And also shout out to all the current patrons. Big thank you as always. And with that though, I'll see you later.